Okay, so we are going live on Facebook. I am here with financial planning specialist, retirement planning superstar, and Amazon best-selling author, Antonio Filippone. Tony, what's going on, my man? Hey, Ron, how are you? Good to have, uh, have, have this conversation with you. Thanks for inviting me here to do this. Uh, seems like a fun thing to do, and uh, thought we would uh, be able to maybe spread some knowledge out there. Yeah, I'm super excited to, uh, I'm super excited to talk with you. Um, Tony is an awesome guy and he has been instrumental in helping me to see other opportunities outside of myself. He was instrumental in helping me launch my planning business. So um, this is one of the ways that I'm able to thank you by kind of giving you this platform so we can prick, pick your brain and uh, get some knowledge from you. Um, you know, before we get started, you are an Amazon best-selling author. It's not every day that we get to talk to an Amazon best-selling author. Do you have some copies of your books that you can kind of like flash up or show uh, our audience as far as like what you do? Well, this was my uh, big claim to fame. This is my uh, financial planning for the not yet wealthy. And this book actually was uh, on Amazon as a, a uh, best-selling uh, category in the area of finance. So I'm really proud of that. Um, I've actually not only uh, had this, you know, purchased by a lot of people over the throughout the country, uh, but I've actually had um, a trainer uh, use this as one of his uh, main books for everybody who went through his training program. They would get a copy of my book, so that was kind of cool. And uh, I've just had lots of neat stories. I've had people from. Uh, uh, back to your neck of the woods. I had a guy in Michigan one time buy my book. He was a, uh, um, uh, not a teacher. What did we call it? Administrative, uh, high up in the administration of, uh, of education. And, uh, he called me, asked me if he can get a group discount because he wanted to give this to his friends and his kids. And I was oh like, my gosh. I, I was floored because, you know, I was in high school, I was like a C student. So, you know, <laughs> I have this, this guy who was like, you know, the, the head guy of the school calling me up, telling me how impressed he was with my book. I was like, well, that was, that was you know, kind of one of the highlights of, of my career. But, and then I also wrote this a little more recently, uh, how to have a happy and, and stress-free retirement. Um, this, you know, I kind of uh, started my career helping people like in their forties uh, start putting money away for their future. And then, you know, over time that morphed into helping people make that transition from, work life to retirement life, because there's a lot, there's a whole set of specific problems that we go through uh, making that transition. Uh, so that's why the second book kind of just came out of that. And um, anyone who's interested in those books, I mean, I just, I write like I speak, you know, it's like having a conversation with me and I just try to share as much, uh, you know, what I've learned over 27 years of doing this. Um, every time I write, I'm just trying to you know share what I know to try to help others. And it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Absolutely, man. You have been a wealth of knowledge, uh, for, for everybody who's involved in the message boards and the Facebook page, like, um, other financial professionals that you've helped out and you've kind of taken me under your wing, um, from people on my end who are watching, uh, this presentation here in Michigan, you're actually in Rockford, Illinois. <laughs> so, right, yeah. um, so we've also, we've tagged you on your Facebook page. So your friends, your family, your clients can kind of see this interview and maybe get to know the guy behind the professional uh, a little bit. Um, man, you, you have an interesting story, don't you? I yeah, mean, not well, only are you a best-selling author, I know you've shared with me that this has been your only career since you graduated from college, but you weren't successful right away. But no. now you own this huge planning firm where you really specialize in retirement planning. Um, but now you own this huge planning firm and you help so many people. Tell us a little bit about how you got started and what your like early experiences were like. Yeah, I, I started this business. Uh, it's kind of unique. I think my story is unique in that um, a lot of people that you talk to in our industry have come into the industry, you know, just by chance, you know, maybe they were a mortgage broker and then, you know, the mortgage business dried up and they had a knowledge of finance. So they figured, well, I'll give this a shot, right? Um, so we have a lot of stories like that in our industry. A lot of people are getting ready to retire and they figure, well, I know something about money, so I'll jump into the financial game. Me, it was I was a little different. I, I was um, right out of college. This was my career move. And 
um, had never done anything like this before. Grew up in a blue collar household with a, uh, my dad was a uh, truck driver, owned the truck. You know, we had a trucking business and um, I was the first one in our immediate family to really go to, you know, ongoing education. Um, and I just, I didn't know what to do. I had very little direction, but I knew I wanted to figure out this thing called money because no one seemed to really understand it. Um, so it always fascinated me, you know, um, finance always fascinated me. So, uh, you know, I started off as a MetLife guy. Um, so well, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So a lot of people know, uh, MetLife and the whole Snoopy, uh, thing. And, uh, it was fun. You know, it was a good company to work for. Um, I was real fortunate because they had a, a training program, uh, where it was, uh, they were doing fee-based planning. And this was in the 90s, and no one had even heard of fee-based planning. And then it was like brand new. Mm -hmm. uh, America, uh, Ameriprise was doing it, uh, and MetLife was trying to copy Ameriprise. And so they um, came up with this brand new idea. We're going to start charging fees for uh, financial plans. And so they kind of recruited me into that uh, early on, which was cool because it was a uh, real good education for me. Um, but... Our, our idea of planning back then was just nuts. You know, it was like uh, we were we were taught to go out and sell this book. You know, it's like this this thick of charts and graphs that, <laughs> frankly, I didn't understand what was in that book. And I'm sure, sure as heck, the guy buying the book for four hundred dollars had no clue what wow. those charts and graphs meant. You know, and that was uh, we were hoping that if they spent the four hundred bucks, that they would actually implement the ideas in the plan, but, um, it, you know, it was an interesting concept, but, uh, really wasn't what my picture of doing planning was about, but, uh, now how yeah, long did you work at MetLife? I was there, uh, about seven or eight years at, uh, at least. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, so uh, this had, book, um, in the, in the plans, was it, um, like life insurance or annuities or investments or all of the above? Like, what were you guys focusing on back then in the mid to late nineties? It was, uh, well, at the time, MetLife was making its transition from being a life insurance company uh, to a full service financial planning firm. That's what they were trying to go for. Okay. So we were doing a lot of variable annuities, mutual funds. You know, those types of products uh, were big because it was the 90s and the market could do no harm, right? Mm, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and nobody wanted to talk to you unless you could give them 30% return. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to go out and talk to people about the stock market and it was just kind of, it was funny. I, I think back to those days because people would tell me, um, hey, uh, Tony, I want to get in the market with you, but you know, you're going to get me out if this doesn't work out, right? Oh, yeah. You're going to pull me out before this thing crashes. Or, you know, and I'm thinking, well, who's going to tell me? Right. <laughs> you know, who's going to tell me when it's time to pull the trigger? Because that's not the story I'm getting from the company. Yeah. Uh, the company is just like, hey, tell them it's, you know, you got to hang in there and just ride the wave. And the clients are relying on me to pull them out. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm in the right spot. You know, it was just. Um, so when I did you leave, learn. when did you leave MetLife? What year was that? Uh, yeah, that was 2000, I would say 2001. It was right around when 9-11. Oh, so uh, you went through the tech bubble pop, like the dot-com crash. You went through 9-11. Oh, yeah. So you had to kind of manage your clients through that. And all these people sure. who said to you, Hey, Tony, pull me out before it crashes, you know, because you have a crystal ball. <laughs> right. They were all counting on you to do that, huh? Sure. How, yeah. how did that work out? Well, you know, I mean, people weren't happy, but, you you know, what can you do? They couldn't blame me. I mean, everybody right. was losing money. Exactly. Uh, you know, it was it, it, it was what it was, um, you know, and we just took different different roads and different paths after that. And we sure. learned, from it, you know, sure. I've been through a couple of crashes in my uh, my my short 27 year career. Uh, I've experienced some <laughs> short. <laughs> yeah. You've seen it all, brother. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've lived it. I've yeah. lived it. So what did you do after MetLife? What, I mean, 2001 or so, like what you made a transition? What, yeah, what the reason, then? Uh, reason I left Met and uh, I have no, 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 nothing bad to say about MetLife. Um, but the reason I, I got out of there uh, was I was moving. I decided to move to where my wife was from. And that's how I ended up in Rockford. I'm actually from Long Island, New York, of all places. And oh, you're uh, a New York boy. Yeah. And by, on Long Island, by the way, everyone 
has been a financial advisor for at least two weeks. <laughs> it, it's like you have to, you know, everybody goes to some stockbroker boiler room and then, you know, tries it for two weeks and fails and then thinks they know everything about finance. Oh, uh, boiler room, fact. Ben Affleck. Yeah, you know, that, was, that was real life, man. There was, you know, I, I met a lot of those guys who had tried that and failed, you know, oh, made man. the cold calls and said, wow, this isn't worth it. So uh, it was kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's that's Long Island for you. But yeah, so I was on Long Island and moved all the way back out here to Rockford because my wife's from Rockford and um, we wanted to buy a home and uh, raise a family. Mm -hmm. and we didn't really want to have both of us have to work full time. She's a nurse by trade, but um, and we could have done that out in New York, but it was like, well, then who's going to raise our kids mm. you know, while we're paying for this $400,000, you know, postage stamp little house? Yeah. Uh, on Long Island, it was like, you know, cause that's, you know, that was the starting price. You know, you couldn't buy a home for under three, 400,000. And that just seemed like a big stretch at that point in my life. Mm. And um, so I would go back to Rockford and my wife would, you know, tell me, oh, you know, my parents just moved into this neighborhood or these people moved into that. And, you know, the housing was like, I was blown. I was like, I had reverse sticker shock. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is fantastic. And I said, even if I come out here and I do terrible, I should be able to pay a mortgage compared to what I'm used to having to do, you know, to survive on Long Island. And, right. um, but it wasn't as easy as I thought. Uh, it was so you, really you went completely independent at that point or? I did, you know, MetLife okay. uh, wanted me to stay on. I interviewed, I, I met with some people out here and uh, they were real gung-ho for me to, you know, give it a shot with MetLife. But I was just like, you know, I'm starting over. I knew I'm starting over. If I'm going to start fresh, why, you know, knowing what I know after eight years in the business, why would I build something for a company when I could be building something for me? Right. Right. Uh, was kind of my right. thought. It, it's worth the risk uh, to build it for me and own my clients, have my own business where I really, mm -hmm. uh, it's really mine, you know, to, mm. uh, and I can make those judgment calls and not have somebody telling me what to do and what's right for my client. Uh, which was a big deal. You know, when you work for one of those big firms, you have to promote what the big firm promotes. Um, right. because, yeah. I mean, that's just, and that's not always in your client's best interest, you know? So I think it's really important to be uh, kind of independent because it gives you, you know, that freedom uh, to be able to recommend things you know, that you feel are good just because they're good, not because mm -hmm. the firm wants you to, to push yeah. a certain product, you know? Right, right. I mean, and you shared with me that when you started and then when you went independent, you kind of, you had some struggles, right? Like going from a company to going out uh, on business for, uh, on your own. Um, tell me a little bit about that and maybe what were some of the points where you were kind of over to, uh, able to overcome the hump is what I'm trying to say. Blah, blah, blah. Easy for me to say where you were able to overcome that hump and, and become successful and, and start developing um, like those beginning stages of developing what you've built today. Yeah, it was, um, it was tough because I was trying to uh, work uh, in a, a very niche market, mm -hmm. uh, helping people insure their homes um, and their mortgages. So that mm -hmm. if God forbid, you know, the breadwinner gets sick and passes away that the house would be paid for. So we call that the mortgage insurance market. And mm -hmm. uh, I had worked mm -hmm. that for many years uh, and done fairly well with it. I made a living at it. Right. Um, but it was just hard, you know, starting over, what I, what I lost and didn't realize I was losing and didn't realize the value of was MetLife had a book of business. They gave me clients to service. Uh, so there was a built in, you know, 800 relationships that here, take care of these people. I right. lost all that, you know, so I had zero people and just this niche market and getting it off the ground was just slow going and I had bills to pay, you know, so it was yeah. a struggle. It was a real struggle and no one knew me out here at all. They, they knew my wife. I had people who knew my wife, um, which was great. But, uh, you know, even that took some time. You know, people were like, well, is this guy going to stick around? Is he going to go yeah. back to New York? I mean, you know, you can't blame them. They don't know my story. And right, right. Um, so it was, it was hard in the beginning, uh, for sure, getting things off the ground. And then um, what helped, I've shared this with you, what helped me is I met a mentor in the, in the industry uh, who had trained uh, well, his claim to fame was that he had trained about 20 different advisors who were all still doing it. And uh, for those who don't know our industry, it has a very, very high failure rate, right? There's mm -hmm. like something like 95% of people fail out of this business within the first couple of years. 
And I think um, that's what a lot of people like just your average person or your average consumer doesn't understand that insurance agents, financial advisors, like they're running their own business. And th those are the statistics of businesses is that most of them fail because most people, they're just not equipped to, to run a business, right? Most people are equipped to become employees. Our school system trains employees. They don't <laughs> train the entrepreneurial side. And it's it's really difficult. And that's part of the reason why I respect you so much is you've been doing this for so long and have been so successful and have helped so many people. Um, but I know you've shared with me, it's been difficult. So um, you were, you obviously overcame some of those early struggles. Yeah. And I love what you just said there about our school system. It's why I homeschool my children mm -hmm. um, because the mm -hmm. school system is really not designed to teach you how to be a successful member of society. It, I'm mm -hmm. sorry anybody who works in the school system, I don't <laughs> knock you. I mean, teachers have a tough job for sure. Well, I'm a former educator in the traditional sense. Like I'm literally a former high school and middle school teacher. I, I get it, man. I get it. Yeah. But you know, so, I mean, my thinking is there, the school system is there to train you to be a good employee, which is not, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, no. in fact, most of my clients are wage earners. They, they are employees, right. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But uh, it takes a different mindset to be an entrepreneur. Uh, I really, exactly. got, yeah. And uh, it's, it's, and a lot of it is, comes down to just that, uh, to just the way you think and the mindset. And I, a lot of it too, I think was uh, not only this mentor I found, but um, I got to give some credit to my wife uh, because she really uh, backed me and believed in me uh, more so, I will definitely say more so than I believed in myself. I, I really <laughs> didn't, I, I wasn't so sure I could make this happen. Uh, but she was always there saying, no, you got this. You know, I, I know you can do it. You know, and I was like, well, I don't know how you know I can do it because I'm not so sure. But uh, she was right, I guess, you know, and, and I think <laughs> having her uh, having her give me that, you know, uh, constant uh, pat on the back and, and, and uh, reassurance that she believed in me, uh, that made a big difference. So I think having the right partner. Uh, in your life uh, makes a big, you know, huge difference. Uh, so well, they say behind, everything. behind every good man is a good woman. Absolutely. And Absolutely. part of the reason I've connected with you and have appreciated your input and your mentorship and your leadership isn't just because you've been successful. It's because you're a family man and you're a God fearing man. And, and I wanted to talk with you a little bit about your family and your children. And, and you brought that up. So um, let's just cut to that right now. I mean, I know that your desire to be a successful provider for your wife and your children and your family and kind of like fulfilling the, the talents that the Lord God gave you. I know that's a huge part of your story. So can we just cut to that part right now, since we're kind of on the subject, maybe you can just speak to that a little bit as far as like, you know, that influence and that drive in your life and, and what you do with your business. Yeah. Well, it's always been, you know, my dad was a, um, uh, I guess a workaholic, um, I would, I would call him, but he did mm -hmm. have, uh, he was a good man, you know, and he was a good, hardworking uh, guy. Um, and, uh, you know, he just set such an example uh, to be a work ethic, you know, that I don't, I don't know that it, that exists as much anymore as it did. I, and, and some, I guess the hardest part for me is uh, keeping that balance, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, and I think oh, it's yeah. for a lot of people, you know, I mean, I, I have a passion for what I do. I enjoy my work. I like to write blogs. I like to create videos. I like to teach classes. I like to meet with people and help them with their finance. I enjoy every minute of this industry. It's just, um, it's fun for me. Uh, it's just fun for me. I, I like, uh, it's a constant and never ending learning process. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the challenge of it all is just amazing, but it, you can get lost in it. You yeah. Know? You can absolutely get lost in it. And, you know, you know, I, there's a lot of top, you know, producing advisors who end up divorced, you know, mm -hmm. and that's the last thing uh, I want. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I try to make sure that, um, you know, I, I make time for the family. Uh, I absolutely, you know, I was raised in a, a very uh, spiritual household. My mother was very, uh, she was my spiritual director, my dad, not so much, but my, uh, my mom, uh, she dragged us to, you know, meetings. Uh, you know, a couple times a week, and she was always there, always, and without my dad's support in that area. Uh, but she set the example, and she was, she was there, whether it was easy or it wasn't easy. We were all there, and uh, I thank her. I I have thanked her for that, uh, setting that example mm. uh, for me, because I I know, you know, part of staying balanced is knowing your priorities, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think 
uh, sometimes while I might beat myself up and say I'm not doing enough in this area or in my spiritual area, I, the one thing I can do to check in is say, well, is this getting in the way, right? Is my, that's how I keep my business life in check, I guess, is, yeah. is my business life getting in the way of my spiritual goals um, or not? And I have to ask myself that on a regular basis, right? Uh, and I absolutely do. And, and I, uh, I do, I, you know, I work hard to make sure I'm not letting that happen. Um, I know that I, you and I, I have, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you and I have, um, I mean, part of our relationship and friendship have been, has been cultivated just like on, uh, on Facebook, it's been cultivated. So I've seen you post a lot about your, uh, religious beliefs and your values. And that's something that I've really come to appreciate about you is your values because in this business we need advisors who have values and who have ethics and who are going to do the right things for the clients and i'm sure that in your 27 years you've probably seen people abuse that and not yeah. do that so can you speak to um like your model your approach with clients um how you can how you implement your values to make sure that you're helping them achieve their goals um why is that so important to you well um, I think it just, I mean, to be, obviously I want, to, I want to help people. Mm -hmm. Um, but then there's also, there's, there's really a self-serving part of this too, right? Yeah. Which is, uh, we, we are in a litigious society. And so, um, my mentor had taught me a, a, a while ago, uh, this guy, Lou Nason, I, I talk about him a lot. Uh, he always taught me, he says, look, you know, if you do the right thing by people, you will never have to worry about a lawsuit. Uh, and because if you, and, and it's really, because if you meet with people every year and you do an annual review, whether you're getting paid to do that review that year or not, uh, if you're continually adding value, if you're continually tweaking your plan, trying to help them through whatever, because a lot of times, let's face it, we set up a financial plan. You know, this, you set up a financial plan with the best intentions and then life throws your client a lemon and it's just all out the window. Right. Yeah. So the goal there is to not go out the window with it to say, all right, well, you know, let's pick up the pieces. How do we fix this? How do we make it better? Um, and even sometimes it's not the client's fault. Sometimes it's the company you put them with. I've had that happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, being in the industry this long, um, I've had companies that I represented that uh, ended up getting bought and sold and bought and sold. And okay. uh, to the point where the product was no longer, you know, what I, anything I was confident in anymore. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So instead of just, you know, uh, sweep that under the rug, you know, and say, uh, Oh, sorry. You know, I went back to those clients and we, you know, a lot of times move them out of that bad situation, trying to find them a better situation. So, um, it's not always going to work out perfect. Um, yeah. but I think, you know, if you're, if you have good relationships with your clients, they understand that. And, um, they, as long as they know you're doing the right thing. And so that's, you know, it's easy to do for me, it's easy to do the right thing. I think, to, I think I laughed when you said it, when you said the question, because what came to mind is the industry tries to regulate ethics. And I just, I think that's hysterical, you know, because you can't, you can't regulate ethics. It, that's not how ethics work. You right? either have them or you don't, and you can do all the training and stuff like, doesn't mean all of a sudden you're going to get it. Right. Is that, is that what you're laughing at? Yeah. I think it's silly that we yeah. have to sit in class for a couple of hours and check a box and take a test. And then we get a stamp that's, you know, you're ethical now. I guess this works. last two hours changed my mind. If I wasn't on off, like, oh, I'm just going to rip everybody board. off at this class. Oh, <laughs> now I'm going to do the right thing. Well, that's not how it works. But uh, that's the thing you do do the right thing. I mean, you and I have had very in-depth conversations and I've, as I'm transitioning here, I've taken like so much about what you've done to help so many people. I mean, that's, that, that's a huge part of what's made you so successful. I mean, this is the greatest service business Absolutely. that exists yeah. and, and you've done so great at this and you've mentioned uh, some mentorship. And I know that you're speaking of Lou Nason and the people over at the insurance pro shop. Um, so, I mean, I know that you give them props all the time and you're not paid to do it. Um, I don't, I don't know if Lou will see this video. I think we're probably both friends on Facebook with him. Maybe he will. Um, and his people and the people that he influences, could you maybe just speak to some of the things that you learned from him and how you were able to take that out into your professional life and help clients at a greater level? Yeah. Well, I, the wonderful thing, and by the way, that's where everything changed for me. I mean, I struggled until I met Lou and, um, he really taught me, uh, to have a belief in what I do. And, um, 
if I was on the fence about recommending something, he says, well, then you shouldn't recommend it, right? So do your research. And he, and I was a young guy when I met him. So I was like, you know, that was kind of a, yeah, it was kind of like a smack in the face. Like I got to do my own research, right? I have to know um, that what I'm telling people is the right, you know, is absolutely the right thing. Um, so I think that was a big, you know, part of my uh, journey was he, um, you know, uh, he encouraged me to really do uh, my own due diligence before I would uh, recommend anything. Um, and then that, but then not only does that, I mean, that just empowers you, right? When you 100% know that what you're talking about is the right course or the best course for people, right. it's easy, right? Because then it's, it's up to them. They can take it or leave it, but you know, you're doing the right thing. And, and um, I think to speak to something you said earlier, um, for me, the, the biggest joy, uh, one of the reasons I, I'm passionate about this industry and this, this job is because I feel like I can leave people better than I found them. And when I know I did that, I mean, sometimes I literally get like goosebumps and excited yeah. when I, and over stuff that sometimes the client doesn't even realize how much of a difference I just made for them. But I know I caught something that totally is going to make them better off. And I'm like, oh, that was so cool that I caught that. Like, I, and I think to myself, I don't, I, and not to pat myself on the back, but after 27 years, there's stuff I'm going to catch that not everybody's going to catch. Right. So um, when I find something like that, I'm just like, whoa, this is, you know, it makes me feel good. I go home happy. It's, you know, it's no longer, you know, I guess when I first started making the big sale was that you'd get that seller's high and you'd be like, whoa, you know, yeah. I got this new car. Now it's more like, I helped this guy, you know, I just saved this guy probably, you know, $200,000 in taxes over his lifetime. Yeah. And he doesn't even realize the power of that, but I do. And I'm so glad I was able to fix that for well, him. He will though. It'll, it'll yeah. maybe come 10, 20 years down the road, but he will, you understand right now, but he will eventually understand. Oh yeah. 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 And then uh, I have clients already in that boat who have yeah. realized what it was that I was able to do. And then they become advocates, right? So they go out and tell their friends. And I mean, like this year, I felt so fortunate, you know, and so uh, blessed really because, um, you know, this is a year that most people are completely struggling. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've just been really, like I said, really fortunate that I've had a ton of uh, call in referred business. You know, I haven't been able to market my business yeah. uh, all year, really. I mean, I was, I did a workshop in January, uh, right before, you know, COVID hit. Mm -hmm. and uh, everything got shut down after that. So you would think I'd be, you know, just sitting here looking at the walls, but I've, I'm booked up a week or two out uh, every week. I've been, you know, two and three weeks out uh, in my calendar and, you know, busy, uh, you know, because it's just the, the work that I've done, you know, it's right, right. 27 years of mm -hmm. building a reputation. And now when things get wonky and people get scared, um, they're talking to my clients and my clients are like, well, Hey, Tony's got me set up. I mean, yeah, we got hit a little bit with this, but we're in pretty good shape. You should talk to him. And, and can you kind of share for anybody who may be watching this video, whether it be like my Facebook connections or on your end during this last four or five months where we've had the coronavirus and it's been like a once in a lifetime type thing. Um, what are, what are the, um, major concerns that people have, they're coming to you, maybe they're new clients, right? Like one of your current clients say, Hey, you need to talk with Tony. What are, what are some of the concerns that they're coming with um, to you and how, how are you able to help them solve those problems? And what kind of solutions are you helping people with right now? And, and obviously we're not giving specific advice, right? We're just talking about some general knowledge. What are some of the general things that you're seeing right now? What are people concerned about? Well, help it, you know, being that I work mostly with people who are in transition from work life to retirement life. Mm -hmm. um, that's your specialty. That's your expertise. Yeah. yeah, that's my niche. And that's who I really serve the most. Um, so we're, you know, right now, people are just so concerned because um, we've been on a 10 year bull run, right? The market could mm -hmm. do no harm over the last 10 years. Um, and so, I mean, since 2008, with the last, uh, you know, crash, uh, it really been an upswing since then so in the first couple of years people were just kind of like still scared still shell-shocked uh, but in the last couple of years people have kind of expected big returns and mm -hmm. think that there's no end in sight and then bam you know we get hit with uh, uh, this big economic uh, issue uh, and so they're wondering well how does this affect me 
you know, am, am I going to be still able to retire? Uh, I was planning mm. on retiring next year. Is that even still viable? Is this, is the timing still right? And, you know, uh, you know, can, can we still make this happen? Uh, because, you know, let's face it, this, it, uh, life happens. It doesn't always happen on our schedule, right? So we, we might've been planning to retire next year or this year, or, you know, very soon. And, you know, right. a big bump like this really, uh, shakes people's confidence, right? Um, so the, the good news is uh, that really uh, this should be a wake up call for people, I think, because um, I've been waiting for this shoe to drop for at least three or four years. Right. I've been. Yeah, same here. Yeah. So the fact that, you know, now we had this and and the fact that we recovered, uh, you know, partially recovered anyway, uh, depends on how you look at that. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, at least the big the big tech companies have certainly recovered. But, um, you know, there's still some some uh, holes in the marketplace uh, and still some hurdles uh, for sure uh, in, in the near future. So mm -hmm. uh, the confidence has been shaken uh, for most people. And so uh, that's the time when they seek people like you and me out because they're like, well, I don't know what to do. Uh, is there a way, you know, to to get through this and to still be able to retire and still meet our goals? and not throw out the hard work that we've already done, uh, saving and, and, you know, trying to put away for our future. Uh, and the good news, I think there is, you know, there's definitely um, vehicles that we can use to protect people, especially those going into retirement. Uh, the sad part is that most people who do walk into my office are not set up in, uh, in a way that they've taken any steps to really preserve their assets. And all they've done is grow their assets. And because the growth has worked so good um, for so long, sometimes they don't see the need uh, to, to start getting into preservation mode. And I think that's what people miss is, uh, and it's not me who's come up with this, right? I mean, you know, there's studies that have been done on the red zone uh, of retirement, which is what, uh, 10 years uh, before, five years after. So there's this period of time Damn. that it matters most if you're making or losing money. So what you're saying is if people like they're getting ready to retire and they still have their investment portfolio geared toward growth, it also leaves them extremely vulnerable if we were to see a, a, a market crash, whether it's caused by coronavirus or dot com or like the financial meltdown of 2008 or whatever the next thing is, you're saying that they're extremely vulnerable if they don't do something. Absolutely, because it's a different game. I don't think everybody realizes that it's a different game that uh, and people get a false sense of confidence and a false sense of security because they've won at the accumulation game. And that's mm -hmm. awesome. Those are the people I want to talk to, uh, right. Because, right? Because they have, they have assets to protect. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, they, some of them haven't, don't realize the danger that they're really in because mm -hmm. the, when I say the game is about to change for them, it, it's completely different game. In fact, uh, I'll, I'll put a little plug in here uh, on my website at financial advisor, Rockford, Illinois, or you can just go to rockfordretirement.com. That's easier to find. Um, but if you go to rockfordretirement.com, I've got a video, 10, 12 minute video uh, that talks about how to avoid going broke in retirement while securing your nest egg. Mm. And uh, it talks about these, this one big risk that most people aren't even aware exists. People know about stock market risk. They know about interest rate risk. Um, but there's a risk out there uh, called sequence of returns risk. And I don't want to get all technical and jargony, but sure. Um, but on the on the uh, 10 minute video, I explain it in layman's terms on uh, what this risk is, why they need to pay attention to it and what you can do uh, to avoid that risk, um, because it's a big deal. And it can uh, taking the right steps now can really uh, help uh, the right people if they're uh, you know so inclined to do so. You know, I've, I've watched that video and so I know what exactly what you're talking about. And it's, it's really a paradigm shift for most people that they don't necessarily understand on the day that they retire, the rules of the game do change. It's like this complete paradigm shift because no longer are you like contributing to your portfolio and investing. You're actually withdrawing money to live on for retirement income. And if you see a big market crash while you're withdrawing income from a depleted asset, it's one of the worst things that you can, can do. Isn't that right? Yeah, we call it uh, getting uh, burning the candle at both ends, right? We first got <laughs> expression. So think about it from a stock market point of view. You know, one end is, is the market's taking money out for you, and then you're trying to take money out at the same time 
the problem with that is you will not recover. It almost see, it almost sounds like you're saying it's like a double whammy or a double negative because two yeah. bad things are happening to you at once. Like market forces pushing the value of your account down, plus you're taking money out, which just amplifies the problem. It's, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. And so most people aren't set up. To, they don't know what the answer is to do for that. In fact, okay. what, what their stockbrokers answer usually is, is uh, if they call up to take money out in a down market, what do you think the stockbroker tells them to do? Nine times oh, better? don't sell. Keep your money here. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You bet. Maybe you should hold off this year. Well, can you hold off when you're expecting to take money out to pay your bills? <laughs> right. I mean, these people are retired. They just have to meet basic living expenses, right? So you see, that's the game change, right? That wasn't right. the case five years ago while you're working and you've got a good income. Mm -hmm. Who cares? The market yeah, down so up, right? So yeah, the income's coming from your job, not your retirement nest egg, right? Exactly. That's the difference. Yeah. You know, that's a big difference. And I'll tell you what, uh, go one step further because some people might watch this and say, well, yeah, but I'm not relying on that money for income today anyway. Uh, I've got a pension, I've got uh, social security, I'm doing fine. Um, at some point, you have to take money out, whether you yeah. want to or not, right? Oh, what's uh, that called? Yeah, we got the re uh, required minimum distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you hit 72, you're going to have to start taking money out. And you're going to have to sell your positions, your equity positions to take that money out. And what if you have to sell those positions when the market's down? Yeah, you know, what happens? You don't recover that money you know okay if you can reinvest it right away sure but mm. uh a lot of people don't you know they just put it in savings and and uh they hold it and um it, it just can really eat at an account it's just not the right way to do it and there is a right way so. yeah, well it sounds like it could be absolutely devastating for somebody's retirement portfolio if they're not positioned correctly i mean would you agree with that yeah absolutely that's you know that's the big that's one of the big problems we solve is you know i, I look at my Business now, we solve three big problems, really. Uh, big problem number one is we need to get the money where it needs to be, in the right places. Uh, a, a portion of it needs to get out of volatility. Not all of it, but a portion of it needs to be removed from the volatility of the market if you want to have a strong retirement. So would you um, call that like a volatility buffer, volatility shield, like something along those lines? Yeah. So we use, a, and you know, I, I've, I've uh, talked to you about this bucket system. Mm -hmm. uh, we set well, up. Well, I was going to ask you, like, without going like into specific like products, because based on the particular client situation, you might use something different depending on, True. but like, yeah. is, there's a general strategy that can, that can help with this, correct? And that's what you're about to explain? Well, yeah. And I don't want to get too deep into it, but I'll tell you what, just to, if anybody's interested, this is a great, great book. In fact, uh, I was just recently asked to write like a forward on this book. So I, I'm really proud of that too. And this is um, a nationally best-selling book. So uh, it's called The Bucket Plan. And so you can get a copy of that. We can get a copy through me or you can just look this up online, uh, The Bucket Plan. I, I have a listing on their, on their website. Um, but these guys discuss the time horizon of how to invest money, that it's not just, uh, it's not just a risk horizon. It's like, it's timeframes. We have to look at now money, soon money, and later money. And uh, if we set it up that way, then the volatility won't bite us, you know, won't, won't catch us off guard. So that's step one is getting that right, you know. So funny that you bring that up because I kind of heard of this. I vaguely knew of it. And then a couple of months ago, you said, hey, Ron, you should check out this book called The Bucket Plan. I read it. I was like, holy cow, like this is a game changer. And now Absolutely. the author of this book, they've asked you to write a forward to it for the next edition or? Yeah. So if you, uh, you're going to quite ever quit writing books or like, <laughs> <laughs> like writing forwards and stuff, like you're going to get too famous and then you'll forget about the little guys like me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's awesome. Cool. I, I enjoy writing and I, uh, fortunately, I guess I have a, a way of uh, putting words uh, on paper that uh, people like. So I I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I enjoy to write. So that's amazing, I can't spell man. worth a lick, but I, I'm a good writer. <laughs> well, that's what editors are for. So you said there, there's three steps. You said, number one is like the bucket plan. Like what was the second thing on your mind? Yeah, so the uh, the first point is the bucket plan, getting money in the right place. The second thing is estate planning. I do a lot of work uh, to help people get their estate plan straight. Mm. Uh, man, I, uh, there's a lot of uh, potential problems with estate planning. And um, it's not a lot of people, well, I have my will, I have my trust, I'm good. Uh, well, it doesn't end there. You know, uh, the reality is your plan needs to be a, updated every two to five years because stuff changes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know in my own life it's changed. Um, you know, the, uh, just, you know, who you, who's going to be the, you know, you have young kids at home, um, who, yeah. <laughs> yeah, who's going to take care of those kids 
something happens to you, that changes over the years, right? You know, somebody you put your trust in at one point, maybe their life is not in the right position to help you in another point or, or people get older, you think your parents will do it and then your parents start to get old. So there's, there's things that, uh, that change in life, right? And they're constantly changing. We all have that. Um, and so we think, you know, we, we did a will 15 years ago, we're good. Well, you're, you're probably not, you're really not. Um, mm-hmm. and, and there's a lot of documents that, um, they don't, they don't go bad. I mean, they don't get stale. They don't, you know, the day, you know, if you have a power of attorney, it's good forever. Um, but your financial institution may not agree. Uh, so we find that different financial institutions have different limits as to how old the document needs to be or uh, how recent the document needs to be before they'll accept it. So there's just things that, you know, you think you're good, but you might not be. And we do a big check on that. We, you know, a lot of advisors, I think, pay lip service to estate planning and farm that out to an, an attorney. Um, we really take, we dive deep. We, we uh, do a deep dive on that for our clients because I can grow your money all day long, right? And that's my job. My primary job is to make sure it grows and doesn't run out. Mm-hmm. But if the people who are supposed to get it uh, can't get to it when they need it most, uh, even while you're alive, and because you don't have the right documents in place, what kind of an advisor would I be? Did I do my job if you can't get to your own money uh, when, yeah. you, you know, when your spouse is in the hospital or something? So there are legal documents that you need to have updated to make sure all that happens. So uh, again, step two is getting the estate plan in order. And then what, what, do you, what would you say step three is then? So step one is positioning the money correctly. You, you, you use a philosophy called the bucket plan philosophy or bucket planning process. Step two would make, be making sure that your estate plan is in order and that it's reviewed regularly to make sure that it is in order as your life changes. So what's step three? So step three is where I like to get into uh, protecting uh, people. So th- the, the other thing is there's other things besides market risk that can ravish you in retirement and like healthcare costs is a big one, right? For a lot of people. Oh yeah. Um, so are we protected for, from, you know, healthcare uh, eating up all of our assets? What are we doing mm-hmm. to protect ourselves? So that I don't usually fix that out of the gate because uh, it's a big problem, but we can't fix it all on one visit, you know, mm-hmm. kind of how I look at it. So uh, I'll go back after we get the estate plan in order and talk to people about putting some hedges in place to protect them for healthcare risks. Uh, what if one spouse, what happens when one spouse passes? That's a big risk. A lot of people think uh, the need for life insurance goes away when you have a certain amount of assets. Um, it doesn't uh, because your income is going to drop and your tax rates are going to go up. So there's a legacy. We call that legacy planning. Uh, and right, that legacy okay. For your kids legacy for each other just to make sure your spouse is going to be okay and a lot of people tell me that's what they want anyway that's mm-hmm. kind of one of the first things people will tell me i just i don't care what we do tony just make sure my spouse is taken care of so right. we do want to make sure the spouse is taken care of uh and we'll use certain uh, leverage or insurance type products to do that and then finally in that mix uh is some tax planning because believe it or not, those two kind of go hand in hand. And you probably realize that I'm sure you realize mm-hmm. that. So you know, your tax planning uh, goes hand in hand with your uh, building leverage for um, if you get sick, or if you should pass away too soon, there's, there's products, we call them, uh, 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 what is it? Uh, lost the word, but I'm thinking of a, a knife, you know, those, those knives you have when you're a kid, and you have, they got like 10 the, blades, the Swiss uh, army knife, Swiss army knife. Thank you. Yeah. That's- I talk a little bit of everything. Yeah. A little bit of everything. So there's products out there, financial products that act like a financial Swiss army knife. And so um, like, you're, you're just saying like, kind of like there's different facets to these strategies. Like, so whatever does come at you, like you're prepared to handle it because of the planning that they've done with you. Exactly. That's, you know, we're trying to make them bulletproof, right? That's mm-hmm. why, why they're coming to you guys like you and me. Uh, they want to, they want to fix the problem before it happens. Uh, you know, not scramble around after the fact. They, so th- we have to put stuff in place that's going to be there to fix these issues in advance. And um, we can't fix it all, you know, like I said, in one visit. It's usually, um, you know, I might meet with someone six, seven, eight times uh, in the beginning of the relationship. I usually joke with them after the, about the fourth time. I say, listen, you know, we can keep going on this or, or if you've had enough of me, for now, I get it. <laughs> you know, maybe well, we look, put a pause. Is, 
<laughs> Look, this and, isn't like a one-time like sale of one product no. or investment or something. Like this is a lifetime relationship with people that you're building. And these are lifetime decisions. Like the decisions that they make are going to affect them for a very, very long time and their family. And so they're building a, re a working relationship with you to make sure they get this right. Because re retirement is... I mean, it's like a one-time event, right? There's no do-overs. So let's let's put in the time to get this right. And we can't, maybe Absolutely. we can't do everything at once, but maybe we meet whatever, six or eight times over the course of a year or two, and then implement each thing that you need to do to make sure you get it done and then monitor the plan, correct? And, and at their pace. I always stress it's got to be at their pace, right? Because some people are gung-ho to get it all done and they want it behind them and they want it all fixed. And I find other clients who are like, you know, this was, this was stressful to just to get to this point, how about we take a break and, you know, we'll do some more in, in six months or a year. <laughs> sure. And that's fine. You know, I'm, I'm not going anywhere, you know, yeah. so I, uh, we don't, you know, push them down the road. We just lead them and guide them down the road to um, fix things as they're ready to fix them, you know, because people find it overwhelming if you try to, you know, do it all, you know, we try to make it easy to, to, so you understand everything you're doing, right? Because, uh, we should both be on the same page. And I, you know, uh, the way I operate, it's got to feel right to that person or they absolutely should not do it. And that includes working with me. I may not be the right per person for them to work with. Um, and that's okay. You know, uh, the whole point of us getting together and meeting and talking is to see, am I the right guy for you? If mm -hmm. I can help you figure that out, uh, pro or con, that's okay. We both did our job then, you know, we, we figured out if this was going to be the right working relationship or not. Cause like you just said, Ron, it's an ongoing working relationship. And if, you know, if you're, if you're like not feeling it in the beginning, it's going to be stressful for both of us. It's maybe you need to keep shopping until you find the right guy that sure. feels right for you, you know? Sure. Absolutely. Well, I think we're kind of coming up toward the end here together. Uh, Tony, you've been so generous with your time with me over the last several months since we've known each other. So I don't want to keep you on this webinar forever. I know that you have a family that you want to get home to and, and spend time with, uh, as you've alluded to earlier. Uh, one last question for the webinar. Um, what does the future hold? You know, three years from now or five years from now, you're looking back. What do you hope that you would have accomplished for your clients and in your business that maybe five years from now, you would have said, you know what? I, I was successful. I made like this next evolution in my business or I accomplished this next thing. Is it like a certain amount of new clients you bring on board or assets or number of people that you helped? Or maybe it's the current clients you already have, like seeing them through the next phase for every advisor. It's different. Like what's, what's your next thing? Like five years from now, you're looking back. What makes you happy that you've accomplished from today until then? Yeah, I guess, you know, it's a tough one um, because I kind of just take it as it comes. Uh, you know, I've not been a, not that I don't set goals, I, I do, but um, I'm looking forward to right now, uh, my son is going to be turning 18 uh, in about a year and a half, right? Uh-oh, he's, uh, <laughs> he's being an adult. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, my next focus besides, you know, continuing my business and continuing to grow it. Um, I'm trying to just grow it moderately. I'm not trying to knock over the world as my old man would say. Um, I, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, build this huge practice with multiple advisors and, you know, grow it to some big, I don't know that uh, that's really what I want. I'm not a manager. Uh, I like just, I like the role that I have today, which is working with the client, not necessarily, um, you know, building a team. Right. So you're not trying to bring on agents who can then bring on clients and build some huge conglomerate. You just love the personal relationship with your clients and helping people. Yeah, that's it. You know, if I could just keep mm -hmm. doing what I'm doing mm -hmm. and keep uh, enjoying the relationships and keep helping people achieve their financial goals uh, and stay, you know, stay at, uh, I mean, I'm at a good level now. And if I could just mm -hmm. maintain that level and continue to grow it a little bit, uh, sure, that'd be great. Um, but really to get my son going in the business, because that's, uh, he has an interest in it right now. I don't know if that's going to pan out, you know, how yeah. 60 year olds are, he could change his right, mind 12 right, times. Right, right. Uh, but if that does work out, that would be really cool. If that doesn't, then I might actually hire someone on. Cause it's kind of like, um, you know, I'm 51. Um, I, I will do this till I'm like 70, you know, at least that's how I feel today. Mm -hmm. I may, you know, you asked me that in 10 years, I may change my mind, but <laughs> um, you know, right now I feel like I could go easy till I'm 70, uh, and maybe beyond. And, you know, I've got a two and a half year old at home. 
Uh, uh, how so old? That, you got to cut out there for a minute. Two and a half. No. Yeah, I've got a 16, a 13, and a two and a half that came along by surprise. Oh, amazing, <laughs> man. That's awesome. Yeah, so he's a lot of fun. And, you know, I yeah, that, that puts a whole new financial slant on my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I may be doing this longer than originally. But I, I was never looking to get out early. That was, you know, or sell the business or no, you know, I, I want to enjoy it. I want to just continue to, to work it and continue to work with my clients and serve them. And um, until I'm, you know, uh, until they, until I'm so old that they start to lose confidence in my abilities. <laughs> so that may well, be a long talked, time. We, well, yeah. we talked earlier about in entrepreneurship and uh, business leadership. And uh, I heard somewhere that you know, we talk about retirement and you and I are in the retirement specialization arena. Um, but I've always heard of retirement as the day that you leave something that's not your life mission. So you can pursue what is, and while maybe you and I, like, maybe that's not our main mission is to help clients with their financial lives because we're both of us are geared more toward we're family oriented, but a large part of what makes us tick is being able to help people. And I know that we both love what we do and maybe outside of a health issue or something like that. I know that you and I both want to work a very long time because we love what we do. Uh, we love our clients. We love this industry. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if you did this until you dropped, God forbid, hope that that's a long time away. Well, and I think, um, <laughs> I guess just to add to that, I think what I would do also, I guess the other thing in the back of my mind is to scale back a little in that um, I could see even in five years from now, the only reason I would do any teach any classes or do any outward marketing or outreach mm -hmm. is to help build my kids business. Sure. If, if he doesn't come into the business, I probably won't be doing that in five years. I'll, I'll give up the teaching piece. Um, and you then stick, stick with the clients that you have and just help manage them through. Right? Yeah. Because yeah. then I could take, like you were just saying, then I could focus on my other, you know, uh, goals, my spiritual yeah. goals, mm -hmm. uh, to spend more time, you know, uh, helping my family and helping people. We do a volunteer ministry work. Um, so I would rather, you know, be spending time doing that. But like I said, right now I'm supporting a family of five, so I, I have to do this. But, um, uh, at some point I could see myself scaling this back. I don't want to let it go because it is something that's a passion and a, and a joy for me. Uh, so I don't plan on letting it go. I would like that to support the other work. And yeah. that's kind of, uh, you know, uh, a kind of a uh, back, my other goal that's always in, in the back of my mind, if I can do more towards that, uh, fantastic. You know, that's awesome, man. That is awesome. Well, just to kind of wrap up here, um, we got a couple comments in the comment section. It's interesting because it almost looks like these comments are, uh, directly um, aimed at something you and I talked about. We have a comment from somebody saying, amen. I'm assuming maybe that was when we were talking about ethics and values. We have another comment that said this is, or that is for sure. And you two rock. And I'm not sure exactly what point um, that person was talking about, but uh, it, I mean, it's obvious that the things that you and I are discussing here, it's resonating with a lot of people um, who are watching this video, who are obviously clients who work with us. And I, and I know that um, we already talked about, you are a heck of a guy. You're all about business ethics. You're about values. You're about genuinely helping people. And, you know, do you make a good living at doing this? Yeah, sure. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do this for free if you didn't make money, right? This is your career. Um, but it, it definitely goes above and beyond that. So I hope that anybody who is on your end, like your, like Facebook connections, whether they're just like loose acquaintances or your family or your friends, or maybe even current clients. I hope that they've seen this video. Maybe they've gotten to know you in a different light that maybe they didn't fully understand or maybe didn't fully appreciate before. And uh, I, you know, I, I hope they decide to do business with you or, or more business, or I hope that it can kind of like enhance their relationship because maybe they've seen you in a little bit of a, a, a different light. Um, but in wrapping this up, how can people get a hold of you? Say they've seen this, they've got questions, maybe they want to work with you, or just maybe they want to explore whether working with you is right for them. Like, how can they get a hold of you, uh, Tony? What's the best way to do that? Really, the best the best thing to do uh, to get a, a little bit better feel for for working with us, what's involved, and what we can do is uh, to check out that video again, uh, the one on RockfordRetirement.com. Uh, there's a video there, how to avoid uh, going broke in retirement. Well, securing your nest egg. If you can watch that video, uh, it just spend 10, 12 minutes watching that. You'll, you'll get a real good feel for the kind of work we do and 
Uh, at the end of that video, there's a, a link uh, to set up a, a short phone meeting, uh, just to get to know you meeting to see if uh, we'd be a good fit to, you know, to, to work together. Uh, and you can go right into my schedule. And, and in fact, right if you want to skip that, at the bottom of the page at rockfordretirement.com, there's also a link to my schedule. So uh, feel free to, you know, book a half hour of my time on the phone. And, um, you know, we can chat on the phone and see where that takes us. Uh, if, you know, uh, there's no, no cost to meet, there's nothing to buy uh, at this point. Uh, we're really just trying to see if there's a good fit. If, if I can help answer your questions, great. You know, uh, even if it's just pointing you in the right direction, whether it be working with our firm or not. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're happy to have a short phone call just to see where that goes. So, so again, uh, that website was rockfordretirement.com. Yes, rockfordretirement.com is. If the, somebody's uh, watched this video and they're like, "Hey, this guy, uh, he, he he's got it going on. He knows what he's doing. He's Amazon bestseller. He listened to our business ethics. I mean, you're a court of the table producer for million dollar roundtable. I mean, you bring in a lot of business. You have a lot of clients. I mean, you're you're a stud in the profession. I, I'm not trying to stroke your ego too much, but obviously I think the people watching this understand that. What if they want to skip the website and just give you a call? Do you have a business line that you can give them or like an email address they can contact you directly? Yeah, so our email is tony at rockfordretirement.com. Okay. Uh, or you can, uh, again, to get, really it's, I'm a week or two out of my schedule, sometimes three weeks out. Of, I know, uh, I know, you're a busy guy. <laughs> So uh, the best thing to do is really call the office. I've got a full-time assistant, Lauren. She's really capable and very helpful. Uh, Lauren can get you on my calendar. She, I actually don't book my own calendar because she knows better what I have time to do than I go. do. So she's right. really good at managing that for me. So it's 815-633-9595 uh, is our uh, office line. Uh, Lauren's here nine to five. Uh, so you can call her during daytime hours and, uh, you know, set up a time to, to chat with me or, or even just to come in if you want to do that. Awesome. Okay. So if you are in Illinois, make sure that you call that phone number, talk to Lauren and get a place on Tony's calendar. It might be two or three weeks out, but I got to tell you, I know Tony, he's been a mentor to me. He's helped me develop and evolve in my business, really modeled after a lot of stuff that he does. He's been extremely helpful. He's an amazing advisor. If you are in Illinois, make sure you, that you call Lauren, get on his schedule and check out his website. Once again, what was the website, Tony? Uh, Rockfordretirement.com. Amazing, man. And this, is there any last words of wisdom that you have for our viewers at 5 p.m. on a Friday night? <laughs> <laughs> Stop listening to me. Go be, be with your family. It's Friday night for crying out loud. Have a beer. Uh Awesome, man. All right. Very good. Hey, this has been great. We'll do this again sometime soon. And maybe you can dive a little bit deeper in depth on a couple of things, but uh, this has been valuable. And I cannot thank you enough for all of the help and assistance and guidance that you've given me. Uh, but more importantly, to all of the clients that you serve, helping them in their transition from their work life into their retirement life. Tony, you do a lot of great work, man. Thank you so much for everything you do. Hey, thanks for having me. And uh, we appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Awesome. All right. See you later, man. Bye-bye.